Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How are you? How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Shukran. Yeah, it's so funny to meet like this now. No, I think it's it's wonderful. I mean, it's a it's a new style. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That it's a new style. I know, but we. It's so nice to connect face to face with people. You know that is so nice. But what can you do? It will come back eventually. But we are so thankful that this social media keeps us connected. We can see each other. We can talk to each other. And um, we are not. We are not. You know, like it's not like old old days that we could not even see each other. Yeah, thank right. uh, thank God the technology is around that yeah. we can use. That's so right. Easily. Yeah, so for that's sure. Right. Yeah. So tell us about you. What's you been doing? Well, you know, I've still been uh, very busy uh, uh, communicating with students, uh, not at the Tim Hortons anymore like before, but uh, on uh, email via email and text and. Um, uh, I've been speaking on webinars, and Jalal knows that uh, I did one uh, in uh, Pakistan yeah. uh, long ago. Uh, that was very interesting because uh, they had a question-answer session as well. Uh -huh. So uh, I'm keeping quite occupied, and, uh, it, you know, uh, I'm happy to meet these students on a regular basis, although it's not, uh, you know, face-to-face -face at a coffee shop, but... Uh, all the same, I mean, we're able to work together very effectively. That's very nice of you to still continue this, you know, job, you know, what you have been doing for so many years now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So, Amir Bhai, uh, do, you, do you want me to start the slide? Uh, well, yes, let's start with the slides, uh, Jalal. I think that uh, that way what will happen is We'll get into the discussion. Unless you have any questions now, uh, Salma, if you have any questions that you want no. to start on. Otherwise, we'll start on these slides um, talking about major obstacles yeah. uh, to excellence in post-secondary education. Sure. Jalal, are you going to share the... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm just going to share in like one, one second. Thank you. One second. Okay, there you go. Very good. Okay. So we're speaking yes, of major obstacles, and um, as we go forward, we'll see that uh, uh, what are the determinants of. Uh, qualitative post-secondary education, uh -huh. who will be able to access this education in the new normal post-COVID-19, right. and how I believe that marginalized may become more marginalized right. uh, as education, the paradigms of education's change. So, yeah. so the lack of, lack of understanding yeah. knowledge of knowledge. Well, I lost that video. Hold on. Yeah, you lost it. Yeah. Uh, it was right here. One second. Okay. Yeah, there. Yeah, the second slide. Yeah, second slide. Yeah. 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 Okay, there you go. You see, when it comes to the uh, lack of understanding and knowledge of the dynamics of secondary, post secondary education. Uh -huh. With regard to funding and, uh, and and scholarships, now there are ninety three billion dollars in uh, scholarship funding in North America. Right. Not all of it has been applied for. Okay. Not all of it is ever distributed, and it is said that only thirty seven percent of it is ever applied for, and uh, the rest goes back and redund gets redundant and goes back to these um, their funding. So what happens is that people don't have the courage and the confidence to apply for these. And yet, if only we knew that the, mar the more you marginalized you are, the more marginalized your family is, 
the more entitled that family is for scholarship funding because over 90, 95% of this funding is available only on a financial need basis. So I have a question here. When you say that the funding is available, then why don't the school take upon them that they should let in, in grade 11 or 10 or what, whenever it is proper, that they should let them know that these are available and teach them how to fill up the forms and how to apply for them. Why don't they make it mandatory in, in schools, this system? Well, these uh, school systems, uh, the counselors at the school, for instance, yeah. don't even encourage, here in Canada, don't even encourage the writing of the SAT 1 and the SAT 2, neither the ACT. And these are basic, basic prerequisites for right. admissions into Ivy League schools and other uh, universities in the United States. And also, these are the tests that are absolutely essential when you apply for funding. That's right. So the basic requirement uh, has not been encouraged. Yeah. It's, it's available to every student in the world. But yeah. in Canada, it has not been encouraged. And uh, although the counselors are knowledgeable about a few local scholarships and sources of funding, I don't think that there is a widespread uh, will to make, to make a collection of the scholarship funding sources, the names of the scholarship trust funds. And therefore there is, there is no dissemination of this information about scholarships. So one has to be, a student has to be really uh, ambitious, diligent to make the searches on themselves. But when I meet these students one-on-one, -on -one, I pass on to them appropriate sources of funding, now, the medical ones for medical students, legal for law students, and so forth. And so this thing is that these scholarship trust funds are waiting for you to apply. Okay. And the people that are really entitled to these funds never apply. But that's, that's my question is that, like, who's going to help them? to apply for this if we know that there is already funding available. So how it is, how can we help these people? Like you can have certain number of people, but there are so many out there who don't know about it. So how they should know about it, how they will come to know about it. Now, exactly. This is where the parents uh, involvement with the schools is very essential. It's necessary. We, we should tell the schools the parents should tell the school that, look, we need more information on the sources of funding. Okay. Even if they're local or they're international, uh -huh. uh, we need to know. And we need to know the processes by right. which we can get these. Uh -huh. That's right. Now, that needs a change in uh, policies of high schools. And I'm going to come to another question about high schools and how I think that new paradigms should work. Uh -huh. All schools here basically require the student and the parents to take the greater responsibility for the child's education, particularly post-secondary. And this is a constructive engagement between the student, the parent, and the school. Uh -huh. like any one of these three components lets the student down, uh, the student gets disadvantaged. Right. So where do you go to change policy? And that takes a long time. Uh -huh. So the burden falls heavily on students. The burden falls heavily on, you know, faith-based institutions, the churches, and all the other community involvement. But we've got to ensure that we start early enough in the process for application for admissions and for scholarships. Right. Early enough so that if it takes longer to get to where we want to get, we will have enough running time. Uh -huh. That's your right, yeah. Now, the, the, I'm coming to this point of the lack of understanding and knowledge of futuristic post-secondary, qualitative post-secondary education. Yeah. And, um, and the advancement in various professions and skills within the national and global economy. It's the slide, yeah. Now, okay. we know that Post-COVID-19, yeah. 
we are going to live in a, a very new world. That's right. It's going to be the new normal. My feeling, oh. you want to carry on with that, Jalal? Go ahead. Please go ahead, yeah. And my feeling is that uh, the paradigm of post-secondary education is going to change drastically okay. all over the world. Uh -huh. And there are quite a few points that point to that the marginalized that are marginalized today are going to be even more marginalized in post-COVID for That's the simple right. reason, for the simple reason that universities are closed and they like the new style of distance learning. They yeah. are learning. Yeah, so I'm going to stick to that because perhaps it's going to be far cheaper, far more efficient. Uh -huh. students, they'll now be able to reach students from all over the world. Uh -huh. And they probably will stick to that, that paradigm and that system, system of teaching. Now, we mustn't forget that the foreign students that come to our universities in Canada and the United States pay three times the normal fees. Uh -huh. for universities. Uh -huh. They are an absolutely high revenue intake student body. Right. Now with them not coming across, that source of revenue at these universities is going to be completely depleted. Right. And when that happens, and it's my feeling it is that with those resources, it was with that income, that revenue sustained our universities sustained our university to the extent that then with that money, we were able to teach our local students. Right. But what happens is once that money is gone, even research and development in these universities is going to be at an absolutely minimal level. Uh -huh. Quality of education is also going to be affected drastically. Right. There are various components and the determ to address the determinants of qualitative post-secondary education, we've got to see what goes on, first of all, in the lives of the students, uh -huh. and particularly marginalized students in marginalized poorer families. Uh -huh. There are a large number of low achievers with low aspirations, naturally, when parents are doing two jobs. Yeah. These are turnkey students. Uh, let's get, they come in. They're all by themselves. Nobody monitoring their progress at school. Yeah. So what happens is for them, uh, also they're fully mindful that the financial situation of the family is not going to allow them to go any further. So right. their aspirations drop. Uh -huh. Their ambitions drop. And they don't, they are demoralized, if I may put it that way. That's right. Now, so what happens is they don't know about the dynamics of the operations of major universities. Uh -huh. Look, if we really look at it, major universities, the Ivy League universities and the top private universities particularly are a business. Uh -huh. They are like IBM, Coca-Cola, um, you know, Microsoft. They're all in there as a business. All right. That remains the attitude and, and, and the basis on which the universities have operated in the past. I've got a feeling the situation is going to be worse. Yeah. And we'll talk so. about that. Mm -hmm. And also with the revenues of these universities being depleted through non-attendance foreign students and uh, not enough money for research and development, they are going to be scrambling for money from other avenues so that they can carry on the basic operations as a university. Now, recently, uh, I read an article that the British government is cutting funds to their universities. Uh -huh. They believe that they, most of their universities are underperforming. Uh -huh. They were able to de they were able to get this information from databases where they found that the graduates that came out of some of those universities have not made it uh -huh. in the real world. So what will happen in Britain, for instance, if they cut the uh, funding and grants to some of these un underperforming universities, some of them, and most of them likely, will have to close. 
or to merge. The smaller universities will have to merge with each other. And then they'll be scrambling for students. Uh -huh. The changing paradigm of post-secondary education, and when that happens in the Western world, in the UK, Canada, and, uh, United States, and even Europe, yeah. we'll, find, we'll find that our children will have a very difficult time getting into universities and getting into the professions and the faculties, uh, fields of study of choice. And this yeah. is where, um, Jalal, as I mentioned to you, I had written to the Secretary General of the United yeah. Nations. Yeah. And I had presented two plans about how I thought we could redeem this, dif this difficulty, this challenge, uh -huh. mitigate it. Yeah. And it was, I was of the opinion of suggesting that we should do more at the high, senior high school level because many, many of the students who before COVID couldn't go to university for lack of financing will now find it even more difficult to go to a post-secondary institution. Right. In that case, my suggestion was that we try some of those successful programs and changes in the style of teaching at senior high schools so as to accommodate the dropouts, so as to accommodate those marginalized students that are not going to be able to pursue post-secondary education. And it is the responsibility of society. Yeah. It's your responsibility. It's my responsibility to see that whether they go to a post-secondary education or not, that these students that are the future wealth of our country are properly, adequately equipped to make at least a living. Yeah. And if I may, Jalal here, um, yeah. if I may uh, enlarge and expand on this idea that I had proposed to the United Nations, was that we expand the high school years from three years to five years. Right. Now, this is not rocket science. Uh -huh. These experiments have been tried in the United States at some high schools, and they've been highly successful. Yeah. The program would entail that after grade 10, 11, and 12, if we extend it to grade 12, 13, and 14, we bring in private enterprise and make it yeah. a public-private yeah. partnership. We bring them in, for instance, the big multinational corporations. And we uh -huh. tell them, they come into our schools, you will have 20% of the say in the curriculum. Uh -huh. You will not affect the basic humanistic mission statements of our school. Right. We'll allow you 20%. Yeah. For those final two years, you finance the entire education program and you finance the teachers, you finance the teaching, you finance the equipment that goes with it. We allow you to reach these students for those two years, allow you to train them because normally if these multinational corporations take these students and start them up in their own businesses, they need to train them. Yeah. They need office space. They need teachers. They need tutors. Mm -hmm. So it is a win-win situation for them to come to our high school for those extended, expanded two years mm -hmm. and teach what they want to teach. Right. Either technological uh, parts of their business. They can teach them management, human resources, and all those skills in those two years so that at the end of the high school diploma, which is now an extended high school diploma. Yeah. These students are ready to work. But one more requirement of the public private partnership has to be that these students must be guaranteed two years employment at market at market value. Right. This will be very attractive for them. Exactly. Yeah. And you see, uh, Salma, what would happen then is those two years would give students who had lost all hope, uh -huh. we give them an opportunity to earn some money right. to catch up with the basic um, entry level requirements for 
uh, university uh -huh. entry right. and it will give them some earnability and what is what we need to do is to remoralize uh -huh. we need to um, give them that spark of hope uh -huh. that even if you haven't made it or even if you feel that money is an impediment for you to go to post-secondary education at the level of your choice, right. then at least you've got earnability for the rest of your life. And what could come out of this is if these students work for these multinational corporations for those two years, they could be um, attracted to the, these very corporations to stay on and work with them and then do post-secondary education part-time in the evenings and still do and still work and get on with their lives. But I think the biggest blessing on that would be that the student is not forced to enter a post-secondary education at a mediocre level right. and, and incur very high levels of student loans. Uh -huh. so those two years will be a, a, a buffer for those students give them an opportunity to think out what their future is going to be in terms of what their thoughts are and in terms of what is available in the marketplace. Yeah. So when you wrote to the WHO, have you heard anything back from them? Oh, well, I've, you know, I've got, I, I got a letter of acknowledgement from them um, yeah. uh, saying that um, uh, they, they'd only uh, accept uh, suggestions, recommendations uh, from states and that I should put my recommendation through my state, the state I belong to. So they okay. have to go through the Canadian representative to the United Nations. United Nations, so, yeah. Yeah, but the thing is, I have put this uh, recommendation forward uh -huh. now at the local level and I'm thinking that faith-based communities <laughs> who run schools yeah. Uh, our local boards of education that run schools, uh, communities that run secular schools, can use this paradigm of post-secondary education in their own schools by inviting private participation of corporations and make it a public-private partnership, right. which are very successful. Uh -huh. And you see, the point is if we create in our high school students, the task force, I mean, the, the workforce uh -huh. that is ready for industry, yeah. this could be a buffer that would save them from really absolutely getting lost yeah. from, academic, from the academic system. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, Amir Keshavji, uh, so, you know, there are 140,000 just the Chinese students come from China every year, 140,000. So because of the pandemic, so they won't be able to come, as you were saying. So now the universities, they won't have that, you can say extra funds or extra dollars to run their universities. So it means, right. so it means the cost will go up. If the cost, yes. cost will go up, so the student, those who are already in a financial trouble. So what are their options? Well, their options is, as I mentioned earlier on, the marginalized, yeah. the marginalized will become more marginalized. More marginalized yeah. And that's why the, I feel that the extension of the high school period from three years, senior high school from three years to five years, five. perhaps is going to be one of our most pragmatic and practical solution for uh -huh. our students in the short run, in the yeah. short run. I'm not yeah. saying that that is going to be the end all and be all of their goals and their aspirations in life. Yeah. But it can at least give them the hope and the courage to go forward uh, in their own time. That's right. I think that's, that looks like to be the solution. And uh, hopefully that all the schools think of it, the whole education system thinks of it and then um, something like that starts in near future and which will help the students and uh, the universities at the same time. Absolutely yeah. but you see I see that post-COVID-19 is going to be probably 
yeah. a wonderful opportunity for us to change the paradigm yeah. of education generally. Yeah. And post-secondary yeah. education in particular. Yeah. And then yeah. we have to we'll have to come up with new plans. Yeah. And and in planning for the future for post-secondary education, it is my understanding yeah. that there will have to be a very deep commitment from civil society. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's and always so nice to years ago, hundred years ago or over, churches ran schools. After that. Uh, government created school boards and took over the responsibility of educating yeah. the people. And my feeling that is that now with government spending so much money uh, with the lockdowns, uh, taxes will be involved. Yeah. Are they going to be higher taxes? Uh -huh or there's going to be a clamor for some sort of relief from governments, but they will not be able to carry that because of loss, loss of taxation yeah. during this, and, uh, and then, uh, this, uh, this period. Yeah. So what will happen is civil society, the churches, the institutions, the families, uh, governments, uh, local governments will have to come in in a big way to help us educate our children because whichever way you look at it, our children are the future wealth of the country. Of course, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you see, universal uh, free education for all uh, should be our aim. Uh -huh. Now, how to have that happen, and that is the letter that I wrote to the United Nations, that we should have this universal post-secondary free education. That's not going to happen at a higher level. We'll have to start working at grassroots level. At the grassroots, yeah. So, yeah, hopefully it will come up. Yes. Uh, so, uh, anything you want to say, Jalal? Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, everyone has to work together uh, yeah. the way the things are going. And of course, like the parents, I think the parents has to be educated as well. Uh, like, you know, because uh, next, next, you can say generation or next few years, it won't be easy anyways. Because, uh -huh. of, because, of, because of the pandemic, a lot of things will change. So I think yeah. parents have to be educated so then they can, we can like, say plan their education or the, I mean, plan their education, I mean, their kids' education. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, by you, like, you want me to change the next screen? Yes, please. Yes. Thank you. You see, what's going to happen now is that with people probably losing jobs, uh, we're getting this artificial intelligence. Um, the economy is going to change drastically. My feeling is that because of this pandemic, governments will become weaker financially. Yeah. They have to recoup. And the benefits that we were enjoying from government in the field of education particularly, I think those, those funds will be depleted. Yeah. And I think that the citizenry, the people probably will have to make powerful, immediate alternate decisions on how to start their post-secondary education of their children. Yeah. And uh, this is where families will come in. And yeah. I think the childhood support system with the family structure, will, I mean, is already breaking down. And um, there is this fear of failure in our children because once you come from a marginalized home and both parents working, uh, there is not much support, even emotionally, in yeah. some of those families. And we cannot afford to lose those students for the long run. We cannot. Yeah. They're, they're essential for our society, and they're valuable for our economy. 
So even if you look at it in purely economic terms, we need to garner more support for these students who come from marginalized homes. Yeah. Uh, you see, what if we extend the high school by two years and prepare manpower for industry, even at the entry level, what we are doing is we are saving our future generations from crippling debt uh -huh. in student loans. And already student loans are becoming tighter. Yeah. So once you see, if they get into crippling debt and lose their morale, we will not yeah. be able to recoup. We will not be able to get these people back on track. And this yeah. is the reason I say that keeping them two extra years at the yeah. high school level and training them there will yeah. be a blessing for industry. Yeah. It will be a blessing for the economy. And at the same time, it will give marginalized families an opportunity to see that their children become worthwhile citizens and then and, and active participants within the economy. For this sure. is what I think we need to have done. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, hopefully um, the this this your voice reaches to everyone, to the parents, to the students, to the government, to the people involved, and some change happens soon. Yeah. Well, you see, that, that, that's true, and, and you know, I'm hoping. Um, uh, I've written a letter to some of the authorities locally to say yeah. that uh, we can start with small steps. Yeah. Maybe, maybe with one school or two schools or a few schools that really can accommodate this kind of change yeah. and see that if, if it works out. Yeah. But the idea is it's got to be um, a three-way partnership. That's it's right. It's got to be the student, it's got to be the school, and it's got to be industry yeah. or the economy because that's where the money is. Yeah, you're right. You see, the educational funding, you know, I can only assume is up to uh, uh, grade uh, 12. And when you bring in uh, the 12 and 13 and 14 in extra years in, in the high school, uh, the paradigm changes and the uh, funding requirements change. But if the education boards are relieved of this funding necessity yeah. and it's paid by industry, it could be a win-win situation for the boards. It could be a win-win situation for the industry. It could be a win-win situation for the uh, uh, public uh, uh, corporations that participate in the system. That's right. It's so always nice to hear from you, uh, uh, you know, always telling us uh, such great things. And I hope uh, it continues and eventually not very after very long time but soon whatever you're talking starts at, at baby steps and it you know gets better and better from there so it's so enlightening to hear you all the time and you you it's it's great to hear you and we can sit and for hours and listen to you but unfortunately that is not possible and uh, we can always have you anytime and and I, I, I bet lots of people will be listening to you and the students and the parents and their voices will reach out to them and things hopefully will change one day. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah. yes. Hopefully. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for Jalal. You have to say something. Yeah, you know, I just want to say, Amir, like, like you know, if someone wants to contact you, how? So how what's to? your email? I'm going to give it away. Oh, no. My, uh, my email address, amir.kishavji at gmail.com and um, I'm available anytime for them. Unfortunately, I can't take them for a cup of coffee to Tim Hortons, but uh, uh, sometime yeah. shortly, inshallah, we'll be able to visit there again. Inshallah soon. And inshallah, we will be seeing each other at our radio station, hopefully soon, sooner the better. <laughs> Thank That's you. Right. Yeah, right. it's always eye opening eye opener for all of us when you talk and give us such good suggestions and um, we wish you all the best stay blessed thank always you. healthy and secure so thank we you. always see you and you keep thank god bless you you help so many people Amen. Amen. all the best thank you thank you, thank you for having me
Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.